Okay. The roots of the Fish and Boat Commission go back to uh, Governor Curtin appointing the first commissioner of fisheries in uh, 1866. And that commissioner of fisheries had basically two assignments. He was supposed to address two environmental problems, prepare an annual report. And those environmental problems that he was supposed to address mm -hmm. dealt with uh, blockages of American shad migrations and widespread pollution from logging and mining in the mountainous areas of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> but also at the same time, there was just the beginnings of a conservation movement in this country, and, we, and, the, and the commissioner was well aware of that fact. In 1873, the Pennsylvania Fish Commission was created to encourage fisheries restoration. Three commissioners were appointed, and in their first annual report, uh, they stated, quote, the large number of streams running through our state have become so depopulated of fishes by pollution and persistent wanton slaughter as to render them almost valueless to the people as a source of food. And the legislature viewed fishing as a citizen's right to harvest a food supply. So the point there is that whether or not you think about it in those terms today, trout were considered a food supply for the people of Pennsylvania. Well, at that point, and because of that, the Fish Commission found itself in the position of having to be sympathetic to both the citizens' needs while being responsive to a growing conservation ethic. And the Fish Commission recognized that wanton exploitation of the resource was not sustainable and made rudimentary attempts at restoration through stocking and also reductions of illegal take. And the illegal take in those days wasn't a case of taking one or two fish over the creel limit or violating a size limit. There were no creels. And in fact, the way the illegal take was occurring through the use, was through the, large, the use of large nets, often TNT and also dynamite. Well, as I mentioned, restoration and stocking went hand in hand at that time. And in 1873, in order to begin a stocking program, the Fish and Boat Commission, or Fish Commission established its first hatchery at Donegal Springs in Lancaster County. In 1876, the quarry hatchery was established. And to give you an idea of when certain fish species appeared in Pennsylvania, certain salmonids, 10,000 brown trout eggs arrived from Germany in 1886. So that appears to be the first arrival of brown trout in Pennsylvania. In 1883, the Lehigh Hatchery opened, and for people from southeastern Pennsylvania, they would know that as the Little Lehigh facility now. And in 1885, the Erie Hatchery opened, and a few years later, we learned that the rainbow trout were stocked in the Susquehanna River. So that seems to be the appearance of rainbow trout in the state. Fry and figurelings were stocked throughout the state, primarily brook trout, by the use of the railroad, and horse and buggy, horse and wagon. They were, nearly every county was stocked with brook trout, even Philadelphia. And how much these fish contributed to the present day populations or the genetics of wild populations that we have today is a question. But in a, in a fish culture environment, it's likely that uh, many of those fish that were stocked in those days were not uh, had not been genetically modified to the extent that we see today, and they could have even been wild fish that were being used in that environment back in that time. In the 1888 Commissioner's Report, it's reported that hundreds of depleted streams have been restored. Well, they've been stocked, but we don't know how many fish have survived. And little was done at that time to address pollution or habitat loss. With respect to law enforcement, in 1909, the first law regarding pollution was passed and made it illegal to discharge wastes that are deleterious to fish. Unfortunately, it wasn't until 1915 until the wardens were finally able to enforce, were given the opportunity to enforce uh, those laws, anti-pollution laws, and enforce the few other laws that existed that pertained to fishing. Those laws in included gear types, seasons, and there was a prohibition on Sunday fishing. They were enforcing that law as well. Now we moved to the middle years, or what I call the middle years, and we start in 1924. That's when you see the first trout creel limit in Pennsylvania, which is 25 fish per day. Prior to that, there was no creel limit, and in the 1924 
summary of fishing laws shown here, it also uh, lists a six inch size limit. The Fish Commission recognized that harvest could limit natural resources, so at least there was a creel limit. Also, there was the realization that there was a need for a redistribution of the harvest among anglers and realized that, recognized that stocking legal sized trout could supplement or replace wild trout. Legal sized trout in those days being six inches. At this point, I'm going to show you a chart that depicts the, the, uh, the evolution of the career limits in Pennsylvania rather than descri describing it as we go through time chronologically. So in 1924, there's a 25 fish career limit. By 1936, it's declined or dropped down to 15. That's because we got into the, into the um, um, problems economically, the Great Depression, and the commissioners wanted to redistribute the catch among more families in Pennsylvania so you have more, more of a food supply. We get to 1952, and the creel limit has dropped eight, and many of us can remember when there was an eight fish creel limit. And then, about 48 years later, the creel limit drops to five. We don't know what impact that had on wild trout fishing, but it was, and from the stock trout fishery standpoint, the drop in the creel limit from eight to five based on creel surveys resulted in about a 10% reduction in the daily harvest of stock trout in Pennsylvania. In 1929, the governor reported to the legislature that streams are overloaded with poisonous matter. So you can see the streams haven't improved very much by 1929. In 1937, the Pennsylvania Clean Streams Law was passed, and in the introduction it says, the law is passed to preserve and improve the purity of the waters of the Commonwealth for the protection of public health, animal and aquatic life, and for industrial consumption and recreation. So the concern wasn't just for wildlife and fisheries, the concern was for the public as well, both from a public health standpoint and for utilization of water for industry, clean water for industry. <clears throat> In 1948, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act was passed, and it was the first major U.S. law to address water pollution. This is probably the law that uh, was established that made sewage treatment plants, or made the construction of sewage treatment plants and the technology used at that time, uh, that technology was, was uh, primary, primary treatment, and primary treatment was introduced into the sewage treatment plants at that time. Um, what's shown here, though, is ongoing, or I shouldn't say ongoing, but a recent uh, raw sewage pollution in the Lackawanna River, which is a wild trout stream. So while we had these laws, uh, some of these, these problems still continue today. What I consider the birth of direct wild trout management in Pennsylvania was, occurred in 1969 when the Wilderness Trout Program was established. And I credit Rick Hoops and Bruce Hollander, Bruce Hollander was the former area fisheries manager for North Central Pennsylvania, with really driving this. And he's here today. Uh, that program was implemented after biological surveys of these streams were conducted. And over time, five management guidelines evolved. And those guidelines were that road access had to be no more than one access point every two miles, that streams had to be at least two miles long or at least a mile from the nearest access point, reproduction had to be adequate to support a fishery, no brown trout introductions could occur over wild brook trout, and the streams have to be open to the public. In addition to that, there's no biomass requirement for a stream to be in this program. So there's a multitude of biomasses that exist in these streams. In 19, from 1969 to 1972, Ralph Abel, who became our executive director in 1972, was instrumental in the development and passage of Article 1, Section 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution. It's the Environmental Rights Amendment. This very important amendment is probably an amendment that maybe half of you or some percentage of you have never seen or read. And I'd like to read it to you, especially since you can't see it, I think, from the back of the room. Is that correct? You can't see it in quotes back there? It states that the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people including generations yet to come. As trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all people. Now, in Commonwealth there also means the agencies of the Commonwealth. And in July of 2017, this past July, this 
Amendment was validated by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which in a majority opinion stated that the Commonwealth is not just the proprietor of these resources, not a proprietor, it's a trustee. We're supposed to care for those resources for future generations. In 1972, the Federal Clean Water Act was passed, and it improved on that 1948 Water Pollution Control Act. And I think that's about the time when sewage treatment plants were required to implement secondary treatment in their systems, which was an improvement in treatment and also helped trout streams statewide. Ralph Abel became the executive director, and he admonished the staff to speak for those that can't speak for themselves, meaning speak for the organisms that can't speak for themselves. The Fish Commission elevated its emphasis at that time under Ralph on resource protection by creating the Division of Environmental Services. And to step aside for a moment, throughout the 1970s, the Pennsylvania Fish, and Fish Commission's Rob, Bob Hesser, who was the Chief of Fisheries Management at the time, worked very closely with DER, which is now DEP, uh, Ed Brezina, who were biologists who had worked all over the state prior to that, to properly classify and protect all streams in Chapter 93, which is the water quality standards that DEP uses today. In 1976, Big Spring Creek became the first apparent wild trout special regulation area with a biological objective. The, the stream had a 15 inch size limit for rainbow and brown trout, two fish per day creel in it, and brook trout were managed under catch and release regulations. The idea there was to provide a fishery for nice sized fish, but still favor the brook trout by allowing the harvest of rainbows and browns. So that's the first individual special reg that had a biological objective, in my view. The Cold Water Inventory Project, which lasted from 1976 to 1982, was one of the most important projects that affected wild trout uh, in Pennsylvania. Before this, very limit, before this time, there was very limited, limited information on a lot of our stock trout waters. And I could go to a file and look in the file, and the only information was there was written by a conservation officer 30 years ago, and it said, fished hard by lo locals, stock 30 cans. That's it, no biological information, chemical information at all. So all the stock trout streams in the Commonwealth were sampled starting in 1976. We collected biological, chemical, physical, and social data on these streams, and the wild trout resources that in these stock streams were identified and quantified. When we had enough wild trout, which meant we typically sampled about a 300 meter length of, of stream section, if we captured 30 wild trout in uh, 300 meters, uh, we conducted a, a population estimate and uh, the biomass was then calculated. The purpose of the cold water inventory was to develop a trout stream classification system where we wanted to stock, stop stocking based on political boundaries, divide streams into management sections, stock similar sections similarly statewide via classification, and manage the best wild trout sections without stocking. And that whole program can be credited primarily to Del Graff, Dick Snyder, and uh, Marty Marcinko. Wild trout in the cold water inventory, there were a number of unknowns. Uh, those were how many wild trout streams existed in Pennsylvania. We didn't know that in 1976. How widely they were distributed what biomass defined Pennsylvania's best wild trout streams on a statewide scale, and how many wild trout streams met or exceeded that biomass. A known was, however, that removing wild trout sections from the stocking would be quite challenging to the agency. In 1981, the Fish Commission approved the policy for the conservation and management of resources. This was Operation Future, and it was an acronym for fisheries utilization through user and resource evaluation. Later, the PFBC motto became resource first and, and was adopted under that program and evolved into a slogan and then into a philosophy of the agency. The most pertinent aspects related to wild trout were one, manage wild fish as renewable natural resources that are to be conserved. Renewable, however, implied sustained yield, not necessarily catch and release. And conserved meant widely wisely used. The second part of the policy with respect to wild trout was to stock fish where wild trout populations are inadequate to sustain fisheries at desired levels. It didn't say do not stock over any wild trout. 
1983, management by classification began. Wild trout biomass classifications were developed in 1982, implemented in 1983. Class A, B, C, and D were the biomass classifications. Class A's met a certain biomass requirement. Those streams, those, those were, they were uh, fine-tuned based on measures of quality and quantity, and Class A's would not be stocked. We took off 87 Class A stream sections from the stocking program starting in 1983. Can you imagine the reaction? Okay, in 1983, we also raised the trout size limit from six to seven inches. The purpose was to protect older and faster growing wild brook trout for another year of growth. And the trophy trout program was created. And that program was targeting brown trout. And in my view, was the first biologically based special regulation program for wild trout that we had in Pennsylvania. 1995, we created a selective harvest program that had a, a uh, artificial lures only, two fish per day creel limit, nine inch size limit for uh, brook trout, and a limit for brown trout. And then from 1997 through 2006, we had a number of special regs streams that we started to allow bait fishing in. Bait became legal. In 1997, the all tackle option was added to the trophy trout program. In 99, it went to the Selective Harvest Program, and in 2006, we started allowing bait fishing in certain catch and release areas. In the 1990s, Leroy Young from the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission led a multi-state fishing flow study, and what that did was allow the agency and other agencies to allocate uh, water resources based on the abundance of wild trout in these streams. That, the model that was developed estimates habitat loss associated with various withdrawal amounts and habitat protection criteria then linked to the Fish and Boat Commission's biomass classes. In the 1990s and 2000s, uh, there was a lot of habitat improvement work that took place around the state. Many dam removals, we're up to about 300 dam removals now in the past 20 years. Some of those have benefited wild trout streams. Uh, stream bank fencing and agricultural best management practices have been implemented. You've seen the Commonwealth uh, along in many agricultural areas. Many groups and agencies have been involved in that, and riparian buffer zones and in-stream habitat have been added to along many streams and in-streams. In 2003, the Fish and Boat Commission adopted the policy for listing wild trout streams, much to the chagrin of some wild trout anglers. But this really benefited wild trout, and now that it legally strengthened the Fish and Boat Commission and DEP's abilities to protect wild trout streams when reviewing stream and wetland encroachment pro uh, projects. Wetlands on floodplains of wild trout streams receive exceptional value protection, and either the encroachment permits aren't issued, or when they are issued, extreme care is needed in, in uh, whatever project is involved. In 2005, wild brook trout enhancement regulations were implemented, and in 2010, the Unassessed Wild Trout Waters program began, and that program was, was uh, generated because of the rapid rate of development in Pennsylvania and also in response to the Mellis Marcellus Shale play. Wild trout uh, programs, and, and we did some studies on wild trout. Two of those are as follows. The 2004 angler use and harvest study on 200 wild trout stream sections in Pennsylvania. The result was we found that there was very low harvest of wild trout occurring in Pennsylvania and it only averaged about 11 wild trout per mile. So the, the point was that there was no statewide need for a regulation change uh, on trout. On trout. The, the five fish crew limit, eight, the seven fish size limit is, is, I, is fine. Furthermore, we did the wild trout enhancement regulations in 2005, and a study of those regulations revealed that there was no program-wide improvement in the number of legal, trout, legal brook trout in streams where these catch and release regulations were applied. And again, this indicated no need for a statewide regulation change. In summary, in the early years, wild trout streams were degraded. Restoration was attempted through statewide restocking and it became illegal to discharge waste that were deleterious to fish. In the middle years, harvest, we found harvest could limit natural resources. It was recognized. It was recognized that stocking illegal sized trout could supplement or replace wild trout. And there was a desperate need for clean water. 
And in the modern era, up till today, there's recognition that wild trout are exceptional recreational resources in their own right with vulnerabilities that require further environmental protection and enhancement. If any of this has interested you, or if you find that you would like to read more about this, some of this uh, discussion has come from the book uh, the, To Protect, Conserve, and Enhance, which is recently published. It's the history of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. And in a shameless endorsement of the book, it's being sold for about 1995 in the rear of the room. Thank you very much.